Now let's talk about your epic work in IVF. You were part of the original team at the world's first IVF clinic that opened in Cambridgeshire in 1980. Um, looking back to those years at the very start, what was the reaction like from society at the time about what you were doing? Uh, from horror to abject rejection of the principle and the practice. It was unbelievable how few people were supportive. And again, it takes, it actually is a mirror image to some extent of what we're doing now with Profan, with ovarian tissue freezing. Um, we had um, some eminent people and some very eminent people. Now, we had Nobel Prize winners like James Watson, who of the Watson and Crick DNA fame, saying this should not be allowed to happen. He was at an American Congress hearing, said he would be absolutely against it. It, it, it wouldn't work. And we had people at the time, uh, Dr. Robert Winston, who, who is now known as Lord Winston, um, some think he's a fertility pioneer, but actually at the time he was utterly against this work. He was very vociferous in saying that uh, we shouldn't allow IVF to happen. And so we were really up against it. There was, um, well, in fact, the head of my own department, the physiology department in Cambridge, advised me not to, to, to work with Bob Edwards uh, at the first clinic, saying that I will ruin my, my future and that actually it's the work of the devil. And it, it was, we were really up against it. Um, um, we published a scientific paper in 1984 where it resulted in Bob Edwards and I having a writ for murder against us because we had human embryos growing in a dish which didn't survive. And it, it, was, it was an amazingly difficult time, but the real pioneers, they were the patients. Because what did they have to go on? They had society against them and a few of us who believed we could help. The other thing that's changed dramatically as time crept on was we just didn't, there was so much we didn't know. There was so much we didn't understand. If you looked at our IVF lab then, it, it really, I mean, even having it in a museum, you'd laugh compared to an IVF laboratory today, the way technology's moved on. We didn't know we hardly knew male infertility existed at all. We were utterly gobsmacked when we put sperm and eggs together and were from a man who had a fantastic sperm count and the sperm swimming at 100 miles an hour to see that those sperm couldn't fertilize an egg, which is why I went on to develop the sperm microinjection technology because we just kept learning as we were going along. It was, it was a hard time, but it was a fascinating time. And now you are the professor who's responsible for more than 30,000 babies. Uh, how, how does that feel? Um, unbelievably humbling. And I know we use the word humbling quite glib, actually, but it just is. I mean, and if you think about it, if we listen to, to Winston or, or, or um, James Watson back in those days, there would be 14 million parents today who would not be parents and there wouldn't be grandparents, and there wouldn't be those children alive today. So in the end, sometimes, and I know people, people think it's very, very hard, but you, you just gotta be bold and brave at times. And even when patients come along the pioneering journey, it's not easy on them because many patients missed out at the time. So it, it, it is tough, especially in a world we live in today where evidence-based medicine is important, and of course, who wouldn't agree you need to have evidence to be able to offer something? But how do you gain that evidence in the first place? So, you know, I would say that, that um, I've been very fortunate, extremely lucky to have been involved in a, a career that, well, what is better than being able to produce a human child, for somebody who wants one, somebody who's going to bring it up, love them, and hopefully one day they will produce generations of, of, of their own. So I, I, I've been blessed to be in this, in this career.